Father Simon and the Collective. My story goes back to 1976. I'm in my mid-twenties and recently married. My wife and I had purchased our first house on a housing estate just outside of Durham, and our next-door neighbours were a very friendly middle-aged couple called Arthur and Jean. There you go, different times. <laughs> now, I'd always had a love of dogs, but unfortunately, owning one had not been possible when we were living with my parents. However, now we had our very own house, a dog was soon on the purchase list. But I didn't want any old pet dog, Father Simon. I wanted a dog I could train and which had a real purpose in life. I therefore decided to buy a working English Springer Spaniel. I read many books on the subject on how to train, house and generally look after such an animal. And I was told it was most important to get a well-bred working dog from a reputable breeder. To this end, my wife and I travelled to Wales to purchase our first dog, as we were told this particular breeder was one of the best in the country. The dog was duly purchased, and as it came from Wales, we called him Taff. OK, right. Malcolm, and actually there's a, there's a note here added by producer Phil. It says, <laughs> Malcolm named it after the River Taff. Obviously, oh, that's yeah. why. Because of the Taff River. There you go. Isn't it a sweet, a Taffy? Different times. Yes. We'll move on. <laughs> we discussed... We discussed with the breeder the importance of Taff having his own kennel and the basics of training and general good housekeeping, including what sort of dog food was the best. Now, the breeder informed us that good quality raw tripe was an... Oh, I should have said, by the way. <laughs> just, Now's the time. Just yeah. a warning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If by you're way, having your tea, mm, dinner, any yeah. kind of food... Yeah. Uh, you might just, sorry, I should have said that again. The breeder said good, good quality raw tripe was an excellent food for dogs as long as you had access to such stuff. Well, it just so happened that a friend of mine worked in a local abattoir and he was uh, able to, sorry, Bobby, was able to acquire whole fresh bullocks tripe for me. A whole bullocks tripe is a rather large affair. So obviously with only one dog, it was impossible to use the whole tripe before it started to go off. So, <laughs> this is... Not one for veggies, is it? It's, it's bad. bad before it goes off, really. Now my wife was not uh, keen for such vile stuff to be put anywhere near our small household fridge and freezer. So in order to keep the tripe for as long as possible, I was advised to keep it in a dustbin full of water, as this allowed the tripe to be kept for longer, and it kept the flies off. A bin was duly purchased and was kept alongside the kennel at the bottom of the garden. This arrangement worked very well for some time with absolutely no problems. It was at this time that my wife and I planned a nice two-week holiday in Tunisia. Oh, no. And the trip was booked for January, <laughs> when, as you know, the British weather is at its worst. Taff was booked into a friend's... If you just joined us... <laughs> <laughs> Named after the river. ...was booked into a friend's boarding kennel for the two weeks, so all was arranged for a stress-free stress -free holiday. We very much enjoyed our two-week break, returned home feeling refreshed and ready for work. We flew home rather late, as these cheap package holidays often did, landing at Newcastle Airport at half past ten. So we're back in the house slightly after midnight, and I noticed my neighbour, Arthur, had his rear lights on. I could see that much work had been taking place in his garden with a small mechanical digger and a very large mound of earth. I decided to investigate and started to walk down the garden path towards the bottom. When I had only taken a few steps, when a horrendous smell completely overwhelmed me. It was, of course, the whole tripe in the bin, which I'd completely forgotten about. So holding my nose, I lifted the lid off the bin and peered inside. Oh, sorry about this, Bobby. All the water had evaporated, and there was now a heaving, slimy mass oh. of putrefied, maggot-infested tripe. Lovely. Oh. Yeah. That's why I chose yeah. this confession. A heaving, slimy mass of putrefied, maggot-infested tripe. Yeah. I quickly put the lid back on, just as Arthur appeared at the bottom of the garden. Arthur had kindly stayed up, knowing that we were due back from holiday that night, and thought he should advise me of the problem. He told me that the smell was obviously coming from a blocked drain, mm. and he'd called the council to try and find the blockage. They had dug down to the drain where several pipe lines met, but couldn't find the problem. However, the council workmen were returning the next day to resume their search. I was, of course, horrified couldn't bring myself actually to confess to the real source of the foul smell, which was, as you know, a heaving, slimy mass of putrefied, maggot-infested tripe. Thanks. <laughs> Seen them live. <laughs> that is quite a good name, actually. Isn't it? The implications of the truth could be quite expensive. I waited until the uh, middle of the night, 
and, working under very difficult conditions, filled several bin bags with the offending material. The bin and adjacent area were washed with disinfectant and generally cleaned so there was no trace left. The putrefied tripe was driven deep into the countryside and dumped out of the bags where it could do no harm and at least give the local bird population a fine feed on the maggots which, as you know, were infesting the tripe. Yeah. Work had kindly told me not to rush in the next few days as they knew I wasn't due back home till very late. So early the next morning, I decided to wander down the garden and meet with Arthur and the council workmen. To their amazement, Father Simon, the smell had completely gone. Imagine. So they assumed that any possible blockage must have cleared itself. How does this kind of thing happen? The council workmen roughly filled in the hole and left Arthur to repair his lawn as best he could. I spent the next few weekends helping Arthur repair his garden, even buying him new turf, which I said had come free of charge from a friend. I thought it was the least I could do. <laughs> we moved house shortly after this episode. There's a surprise and lost touch with Arthur and Jean. So 40 years later, I am finally seeking forgiveness because I never told him the truth. Uh, uh, forgiveness for putting them and all their neighbours through such a horrible time. To the council workers, not much. As the foreman told me, it was a slack time for them, so they didn't have much to do anyway. So mm. at least I gave them some work, says Malcolm, rather uh, <laughs> benevolently. So yeah. Very nice of you, Malcolm. Thanks very much. Well, <coughs> the thing is, you can understand that if you're responsible for... Uh, an amazing amount of work from the council coming in to try and find the smell, whereas actually it's just your bin of tripe, which you hadn't mentioned. Who's going to say, oh yeah, sorry, I should have told you it was my bin of tripe? I reckon most people would have done what Malcolm did. Let's see what Sister Bobby would have done. Well, She's looking stern. If he'd come clean, it would have saved them another day's work, wouldn't it? Having said that, they did go back and it was gone, so they decided it must have cleared. So, so it's not like they dug for another few days. But I was thinking, 1976, that was a big heat wave, yes? Yes. So I'm thinking the heat, the smell, but also, I was thinking something else which I'll come to. I th actually thought we were heading down CSI territory to, for a minute. I thought something much more sinister was going on. Murder? Yes. I thought someone was wow. saying terrible. Uh, would have been um, a departure. But yeah. because you bought Arthur Turf and because you went out and did the work, and obviously Taffy was now on mince morsels for the rest of his life. It's just I think. Taff, actually. It's just yeah. Taff, sorry. Because <laughs> it's named after the river, not anything else. Well, the sweet. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I think this time you're forgiven. Imagine that if there'd been a murder happen then. That yes. would be a whole different feature. Mm. What have you got there, Matt? Well, I'm going to say, I mean, you know, he was on holiday. They were on holiday. You know, if, 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 if this had happened when they were there, then they'd have been able to explain. But they'd gone on holiday, so then the council turn up. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm in his corner there, and I'm going to guess that Arthur and Jean worked out that it was Malcolm because he was suddenly being really nice and helping out in the garden and, oh, my friend's got all this free turf and I'm going to help you out and blah, blah, blah. I I think they had you sussed. And, and also this thing you tagged on at the end about the council workers saying, we had nothing else to do. I'm not buying that. So for that reason, I am going to not forgive. <clears throat> Having been dining out, so to speak, on this story for 30 years, I beg for forgiveness from you and the team. More importantly, from my husband. Let's call him Pete to protect his identity. Just to remind you, it's a, there's a PG on this. Okay. I oh. Is that because of food? No. Okay. It's a biological thing. Oh, good. Ooh. Whilst my husband knows I've told a few people this story over the years, he probably doesn't realise just how often I have retold this story at his expense. Hence, I will tell it one more time to you and your listeners, then you can judge whether I was wrong to do what I did. OK? 30 years ago, I was expecting our first child, and having driven home from a holiday in Ireland in late October, we arrived home early in the morning, rather tired and weary, having been on the overnight ferry. We went straight to bed. Being pregnant, I was shattered, stayed in bed, while Pete later got up and was preparing for his usual Saturday, following his beloved Luton Town Football Club. Of course, as any wife will know, there is a sacred pre-match ritual which hasn't changed for decades. Step one, get up, go and get the newspaper. Step two, have a big breakfast, make several phone calls to your mates, making arrangements which sometimes involve speaking in tongues or secret codes. <laughs> sometimes calls involve having to go into the garage or the shed, as there apparently the mobile has a better signal there. Really? Step three, offer to do small, and I repeat, small jobs around the house, but only if Luton are at home. <laughs> Step four, when I ask, what time will you be home, we end up playing the try-and-pin-him-to-a-time-for-dinner game, where he will say, well, I've got to meet a man about a job. 
It's Bert's birthday. I need a pint with him. Dave is over from Peterborough. I haven't seen him for ages. Or last week, Chris ran over a squirrel. <laughs> and we're having what? a wake. <laughs> and so after 30 years, we skip step four. I don't make dinner. Step five, get shaved, washed and dressed. Step six, ask for a lift to the pub as it's not possible to go straight to the match because apparently it's bad luck. And of course, you can't ask the question straight out. That's against the rules. So he will ask, are you popping to your mum's later? Or we could look at wallpaper this morning if you like. Or would you like to go out for Sunday dinner tomorrow to save you cooking? The list is endless when you've been married for 33 years. Anyway, we we're at step five when it happened. I was asleep in bed when suddenly there was a blood-curdling scream. I shot out of bed, and as I stood at our bedroom door, I saw my husband staggering across the landing, naked, except for a small towel around his waist. What? I shouted. What? As he stood sweaty and pale. With that, he dropped his towel and gestured downwards. And on the end of his Mr. Happy... <laughs> Suspended upside down like one of those extreme rock climbers you see on television was a queen wasp. <laughs> what? Oh, what? <laughs> oh, no, that's terrible. It appears the wasp had found its way into the airing cupboard as it was <laughs> nice, quiet and warm. Somewhere to hibernate among the towels. No. Peter just got out of the shower and wrapped the fresh <laughs> towel around his waist. I was mid-shave when he felt something tickle. Oh, hello. So he had a scratch. Yeah. This almost proved fatal. So not wanting to startle the wasp, afraid it would sting him again, <laughs> and with my husband frozen to the spot and unable to speak, I edged slowly, very slowly, and got closer and closer, with my finger and thumb poised like a coiled spring. I got ready to flick the wasp away. Pregnant ninja-like, I crept nearer until I was about half a centimetre away, and kapow! <laughs> the offending creature was propelled across the landing and onto the floor, and I threw the towel over the wasp. Then as Pete dropped to his knees in relief, looking a ghostly white, and with his lips trembling, muttered, How long have I got? I snapped back, it's a wasp, not a rattlesnake. <laughs> For the purposes of decency, and so as not to offend listeners, the aforementioned Mr Happy will now be referred to as Malcolm. Okay. Pete and Malcolm were in shock. In shock. Pete staggered across the bedroom and lay down on the bed, hyperventilating. I laughed unsympathetically, hysterically in fact, but Malcolm's head had begun to swell. We had no choice but to go to A&E. He had to ring his friends to explain that he would be late for the match. On arrival at... On arrival at accident and emergency, the hospital were carrying out building works and diversion signs were in place. <laughs> but as we walked around the hospital, we took a wrong turn and ended up in a ward. I started to blurt out the story as to why Pete was in pain and walking funny, only to be told we were in the wrong department and we were kindly redirected. However, once we'd arrived in the relevant department, the staff were giggling in huddles and pointing at Pete as he walked through A&E like John Wayne, having just dismounted after driving cattle non-stop across America for two weeks. Once inside a small cubicle, the doctor arrived, and after inspecting Malcolm, decided on an injection into the swollen area. I left the cubicle in pain and unable to breathe myself. I wasn't in labour, but I was doing exactly that noise that Matt was doing, stifling my laughter. Like any true fan, he was determined not to miss the match, and met his mates later on. Days, weeks and years followed of Mickey-taking and inappropriate jokes at his expense. So please, I beg forgiveness for these friends as well, who are indeed still the same group of friends from over 30 years ago. As for Malcolm, there were sadly no lasting effects and he made a complete recovery. <laughs> so, Father Simon and team, I await your verdict. Am I forgiven, please? Well, there you go. Could happen at any time. You have to check the, lowering, the, uh, the airing cupboard. You never know quite what's going to come out when you wrap a towel around you. You have to take precautions. Who knew that Malcolm was an acceptable... <laughs> yeah. It made things easier, I suppose. It did. It? Uh, anyway, Sister Bobby. Imagine what it was like for the wasp. I mean, their point of view, it's pretty tough as well. Well, I don't it? think, even in the interest of balance, we have to consider <laughs> yeah. the wasp. And what I was trying to do is... Uh, Wendy, thank you for a really great story. The Queen wasp maybe had, the, had a great time. Anyway.
anyway, uh, I love this. That's a dream it's day be for one a queen. Of the funniest was. ever. It's it's not often that Matt and I are really reduced both to tears at the same time for as long, and the whole gallery. So thank you for a great story. So on our behalf, Wendy, I say thank you very much for this story and making us laugh. And Pete. Thank you for your forgiveness for allowing it to be retold, because I think it should be told time and time again uh, whenever anyone's down. That's a brilliant story. You are forgiven. The thing is, with all, with all the six steps about what it's like to support Luton Town at home, yes. was no warning at all as to what was, what what, was coming What next. I loved most of all is that image of you've got a very pregnant Wendy, obviously naked from the bed, wondering what's gone on, and you've got another naked man. And, you know, the rest of it, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful vision. What Thank a beautiful much. picture that was, mm. yes. yes. I'm sure I won't be the only person after that story who's going to be checking rather hard the towel before I put it on after I come out of the shower uh, tomorrow morning. Um, I'm going to Particularly say... Particularly now, sleepy wasps. Sleepy wasps. Sleepy wasps. Yes, coming in, as they do in the end of September. They're particularly Better not be anywhere near my airing cupboard. Um, so I am obviously going to forget, because that is the funniest... That is one of the... Certainly, I think that's the funniest confession we've done this year. Year. That is superb. Uh, definitely, definitely going to forgive. And uh, yes, you should tell. If, if I had that story, I would be wheeling that one out every dinner. Anytime anyone comes out, did I ever tell you the story about the wasp? That's precision flicking as it well, is. isn't uh, it? Uh, yes, Wendy? Wendy has done very well with the. with Because that could have. Anyway, yeah, it doesn't bear thinking about. Uh, so, uh, yes, definitely. Dear Simon and team, my confession takes you back to one morning a couple of years ago when some friends called Jim and Jane, asked if we could do them a rather large favour. They needed someone to look after their beloved baby daughter, Jessie. I say large favour as the baby was in fact large. Very, very large, huge. In fact, a giant baby. Having children of our own, we were, se we were seemingly a safe choice to look after this child for a few hours. Pull yourself together, <laughs> Mr Mayo, right now. Even our own children were delighted by this new experience, as in our family, this child was legendary as being the biggest <laughs> baby in history. <laughs> this is going to be good. The allotted time came, and the young lady was dropped off at our home, along with a large bag containing the necessary accessories. It's not that funny yet, is it, really? And several heavy packs of baby. <laughs> Would you like somebody to take over? Are you all right? This is like a cartoon image I've got. You see, now, now I'll do it perfectly now. <clears throat> she was a grizzly baby and proved, <laughs> proved difficult to comfort. We all took turns to entertain her, but all of our efforts were met with surly disapproval. Imagine our delight when the infant broke into a large grin and the sobbing stopped. To our surprise, her little eyes were fixed firmly on on our beloved household pet, Rover the dog. I think we probably needlessly changed the name of the dog here. So the dog is going to be called Rover for the purpose of the story. Now, Rover was experiencing, uh, was experienced in entertaining young folk and had taken a hand, or paw maybe, in raising our own children. So we were relieved that at last something had been found to distract Jessie the monster from her misery. As responsible adults, we were, of course, supervising the baby carefully around the dog, although more for the dog's sake, as one blow from the mighty baby hands could have caused the most damage. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> what was Rover? Was he one of those little lap dogs? <laughs> <laughs> little ha Probably. hamster things? I don't know, really. Uh, we were disappointed that the... Uh, could, that's true, actually. The dog could have been smaller than the monster <laughs> baby. We were disappointed that the happy giggles were again replaced by wails and sobs when Rover left his basket and approached our guest to extend the paw of friendship, but we assumed the baby was just a little nervous of meeting her first dog. Rover was sent back to his basket and the child again focused on him and showed much pleasure, clapping her pudgy hands in joy and wriggling frantically on my knee. Rover was once again beckoned over, but again the tears returned. In a confused state, we now relegated Rover to the garden and continued to try to please our high-maintenance guest. Following a somewhat challenging nappy change due to the... <laughs> due to the vastness of the thighs. It's just hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> changing nappies. No, it was the vast thighs that got me. <laughs> <laughs> Baby Jesse. <laughs> oh, I'd like to apologise, listeners. This could go on and on for some time. Yeah, it was placed on a soft blanket, I do apologise, on the floor, to allow a moment for the circulation to return to my legs. <laughs> I think he's laying an egg. <clears throat> Stop it now. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> Oh I, I, you know, I think, I think he can't carry on. No, I'm going to carry on. Are you? <clears throat> I can't see, I Come see on. anything. He's actually crying. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Come on, big breaths. It ends sadly as well. A little determined crawling began, and safe in the knowledge that every possible danger had carefully been removed to accommodate our guest and vastly relieved that she finally seemed happy, I began to do a little tidying up. Poor old Rover was sitting in the garden, gazing wistfully in at us through the patio window. His brown eyes seemed to brim with sadness, and a paw reached out to beckon me. A low whine escaped him, and his entire doggy being seemed fraught with misery. He seemed to be looking from me to something in the room behind me, and I suddenly realised this might be an unlikely lassie moment, and turned in an attempt to work out what this message was meant to be. Baby Jessie was no longer on the floor where I had left her, and after a moment's panic was relieved when I spotted her in Rover's doggy bed. However, the cause of Rover's distress and the cause of Jessie's earlier interest in him now became obvious. Several weeks ago, my husband had been seized by a sudden impulse to treat our beloved dog uh, and had purchased a very large meaty hoof from the local pet shop. A whole hoof. It had soon looked past its best and even a little green, but as it seemed to give great pleasure to our hound, it was allowed begrudgingly to stay for him to munch on. This hoof was now grasped in Jessie's podgy hands as she sucked upon it happily, oh, clearly delighted yeah. with this tasty new treat. With a push and a shove, Jessie could get most of the hoof in her mouth at once, oh. though this necessitated breathing through her nose. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, I promptly recovered the offending hoof, and I'd like to add that no ill effects were ever felt by the child, thanks, no doubt, to its cast-iron constitution. I seek forgiveness not so much for allowing a friend's child to snack upon animal byproducts, but for the distress caused to our much-loved family pet who had to watch through the glass as his much-loved hoof was defiled by another. I hope you can find it in your hearts to forgive. Very best wishes from Lorna. And anyway, got there in the end. Uh, that was an ordeal. Uh, OK, sister, sister Rebecca. My favourite line in this tale was the fact that Rover had had a hand in raising our children. Yes. What does that tell you about well, Lorna? Yeah, well, I think true. it was a great tale, wonderfully written. I think most babies have eaten a lot worse than hooves. What, a whole hoof? Well, you know, we was only, she was only sucking on it. It was fine. To, you know, germs are good, aren't they, for it babies? It was a manky old hoof. I think it's absolutely fine. No, no harm done. And I think, Lorna, your tale was so hilariously written, you're more than forgiven. Mother superior. We used to call babies like that Bonnie, didn't we? A Bonnie baby meant a fat baby. Um, are you all right, by the way, Sonny? I'm OK, thanks. You should yes. stop holding your sides like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was a very one of our funniest, I think. When I got to page two, I genuinely couldn't see. No, because you were crying. Yeah, we noticed. Um, I just think that, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a, such a funny story. And, and you know, the, the fact that she was sucking or eating a hoof. Just sucking the hoof. Uh, sucking a hoof. Uh, I think probably um, it would, she had no ill effects. Yes. I'm not quite sure. Who, who needs to be forgiven? Because I think, Lorna, I would definitely forgive her. I mean, the owner of the hoof, presumably, is the only one who's upset. Well, he was dead anyway. Presumably. Yeah, yeah, brother. I, I think you're pretty much guaranteed to get completely forgiven by everyone when you do a story as funny as that. I've, I've certainly done myself an injury listening to that. It was superb. We want more giant baby confessions. Any confessions <laughs> involving huge babies and their massive thighs. Yes, please. <laughs> Forgive me. Father Simon and the perspicacious and pulchritudinous pastorate. Very wow. good. Very good. We I need a dictionary. We, we haven't had that one before. <laughs> Thanks, Jules. They all talk like that in New Zealand. Yeah, they do. As a devout, <laughs> as a devout bibliophile... And a careful and cautious library borrower, I am never an overdue fine against my name, not one. It pains me to write this confession. But I seek your forgiveness for a heinous crime against books, committed in the winter of 2015. It was a bleak and miserable winter in the most southern depths of New Zealand. My son had just turned three, and the freezing days were full of sleet and bitter Antarctic winds. The weather meant that we were often confined to the house, and many hours were spent snuggled by the fire reading books. Our small city boasted a wonderful library, and whenever we felt brave enough to face a trip across town in the howling southerlies and horizontal hail, we sought refuge in the council facilities there. And every time without fail, we returned home with a, a skyscraper stack of new books that I could barely carry. As I mentioned, I was a diligent and conscientious library borrower. I had a specific library book bag, extra large and reinforced to carry the weight of the 20 to 30 books we borrowed at a time. Goodness, that's, a, that's a large amount. But yeah. I guess if you, could, if you can only go when weather permits. 
Oh, yeah. yeah. Then uh, maybe yeah, that's right, understandable. Yeah. All library books stayed inside this bag when not being read. And at the end of the lending period, they were carefully checked off one by one against the receipt to ensure none were missing. This habit had served as well and was also a sanity saver, as I am prone to slight control freak tendencies when it comes to misplacing items, particularly borrowed ones. But with this system, there was never any need to panic as the books were always where they should be and always accounted for. Now, also, as mentioned earlier, Father Simon, it was a particularly cold and fearsome winter. Most of the windows were double glazed. However, the bathroom wasn't. And we would regularly wake to find a thick layer of condensation frozen in a smooth pane of ice covering the inside of the bathroom window most mornings. We did have a fire hour, however, and we kept it stoked night and day, which kept the house a very comfortable temperature and was also a great source of delight for our cat, who enjoyed lounging in front of it. The living room door was kept ajar at night to allow the heat from the fire to escape down the hallway and keep the overall temperature of the house at a more ambient level. You should know central heating is a rare feature in New Zealand homes. Which I, I, didn't know. Which I no. did not know. No. One morning I woke to find the door to the lounge closed, but aside from the minor annoyance of the overnight heat not having reached us, I didn't give it much thought. The day continued as usual, and after lunch I decided that since my son had given up his afternoon nap, some quiet time reading in a bean bag by the fire was called for. I walked towards the book bag, tucked carefully next to the coffee table, where the library books were always so carefully stowed at the end of each reading session, as I think I've told you. I leant down to select a few books, and lifting them out of the bag, I noticed that the books I was holding were damp. Oh, no. How strange, I thought to myself. Has someone spilled a drink in here? Did the roof leak in the night and drip into the bag? I leafed through the bag of books and removed the handful of damp ones, <laughs> noting their curling pages as my sense of puzzlement grew. Father Simon, the sudden dawning of realisation as to why these books were wet hit me at the same time as the smell, the acrid and unmistakable stinking odour of cat oh. urine. Oh, no. oh, Is that what no. you wrote on your yes, note? Yes, I did. I wrote this. Go. Passing notes. Yeah, that's upside down, but <laughs> oh. I think it says cat wee. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Cat weed, you've written, which uh, yes. is something else and also illegal. Anyway, I realised oh, in horror good. that the closed door I discovered in the morning had meant the cat had been trapped in the lounge overnight with no access to a litter tray. She had chosen my pile of books in the bag to use as her makeshift toilet and the paper pages of the books had done a fine job of absorbing the liquid. Well, Father Sam, what could I do? What did I do well? Did I ring the library to confess, apologise profusely and offer to pay for the damaged books? No, I did not. Instead, I did what any quick-thinking mother would do when faced with unwanted we. I washed the books. I actually did. I actually washed them books. Armed with a spray bottle of disinfectant, I held each book over a bucket and sprayed and sprayed to dilute and wash away the cat urine. Then I used a towel to blot the Dettol-soaked pages before putting the books in the hot water cupboard with the wet pages carefully spread apart so as not to stick together. My horrified husband was silently complicit after I confidentially said, It'll be fine. <laughs> Actually, confidently said, not confidentially said. <laughs> I confidently said, It'll be fine! It'll be fine! Because <laughs> they talk like that. And yeah. said. The books took two to three days to dry and another two days with heavy objects on them to try to iron out the wrinkles of the paper from having been wet, which is almost an impossible task. Then I waited until a weekend evening when the library wasn't open and hurriedly returned the books through the after-hours slot. We no longer live in the South Island, but until we shifted, I avoided making eye contact with the librarians <laughs> in that particular city. Just I like still that. flush with shame every time I think of my actions. So I imagine she's gone to the North Island now. Where yes. Father Simon, I beg forgiveness not only from the librarians, but from all the parents and children who have subsequently borrowed these picture books and wondered what the strange smell was. Well, it's, the answer is disinfectant mixed with cat wee <laughs> emanating from the crumpled pages. Will the collective find it in their hearts to forgive me? My guess is, Jules, from the South Island, my guess is probably yes. Because you were trying to do the right thing. I suppose the, entirely the right thing would be to replace the books, but there are a lot of them. Sister Bobby. Lovely story. Really lovely story. And for any of us who had animals and, and faced with that, you know, when you step in it with a sock. But I have to say, books are uh, important. And, of course, the library had lent you books for free 
for many years. And I think on this occasion, Jules, although it seems quite tough, I think what you should have done is cleaned it off anyway, gone and been honest, and then said, would you like me to replace them? Then they might have said, actually, look, they're still intact. They're still usable. Thank you very much. And taken them, taken them back. But I think, Jules, you should have owned up because that library had served you well. And maybe then you wouldn't have had to move across to another island and escape. So you are not forgiven, Jules, on this time. That after hour slot would have smelt quite yes. uh, pleasant, wouldn't I it? Mean, on the Monday be morning. Here, you know, Jules went. <clears throat> excuse me. She went uh, above and beyond, didn't she? Uh, with with cleaning this uh, this particular all of these books. I think I'd have done that. I'd have tried to dry them out, and then you know put them in the after hour slot, and then move to a different island. But I think what we're doing here is we're forgetting the real culprit here, which is the cat, which flouncing around, lounging in front of the fire, so cats do. treating everything like it's the. Walking around like they're walking onto the daddy's yacht and then treating literature as his own personal litter tray. That's where the finger of blame should be Are pointing. Are you saying the cat represents the, the upper class? Co correct. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I'm... Class war against the cats. So uh, I am forgiving. They're very art school, the cats, aren't yeah, they? It's like they're so just in their head, berets. they're wearing a beret all the time. Father Simon and the Cookery Confessional. This is for my 14-year-old son, Max who will actually be listening to this on the school bus on the way home. It's actually his 14th birthday today, and I feel it's time to come clean about something I've been hiding for nearly half of Max's life. Now, at this time, I imagine Max is thinking, what? What, what on earth is yes. going on? So we're on in the coach. Uh -huh. So hello, Max. Happy birthday. Yes. Hope everyone's got you a card and all that kind of stuff. And now everyone is listening. What on earth? <laughs> Is Max's mum going to... It could be all manner of things. OK. For the past 14 years, the making and presentation of our two boys' birthday cakes has been a bit of a thing. Phew, says Max. <laughs> <laughs> it's about Wrong cakes. cakes. Yes. All right, it's fine. As we run our own design agency and being marginally on the competitive side, designing and making an amazing themed cake in true showstopper style to impress my sons and their friends has always been part and parcel of the parenting deal. Now, when the boys were little, it was easy to put them to bed, drag out the cake I'd baked the day before, decorate it in the evening while the little ones were safely tucked up. The cake presentation being a thing needed to be a secret and obviously it needed to be increasingly impressive. However, as the boys got older, trying to hide and make the cake in the evenings when they are less inclined to be in bed by 7pm has made things a little bit more tricky. So I'm sure you can only imagine my feeling of impending doom when the night before Max's eighth birthday, I was standing in my supermarket of choice at 7pm, staring pathetically at the cake ingredients with no cake theme in mind and definitely no cake uh, sitting, waiting to waiting at home to be decorated. My excuse was that I completed a full week's work, including two new client presentations, and now it was looking like a long, long night ahead. Having filled my basket with the ingredients to make and decorate some sort of cake, I walked miserably down the aisle to the checkout, where now to the corner of my eye, in the fresh cake counter, I noticed a row of three glorious, fresh chocolate cakes. A triple chocolate fudge cake, a slightly smaller chocolate cake, and a third even smaller, very, very extremely chocolatey cake. Oh. I literally, is it a starby day? It is, Excellent. yes. I literally stopped and stared at the cakes for about 10 minutes, weighing up in my mind whether my conscience would allow me to take just on this one occasion a short cut. I picked up all three cakes and put them in my basket. Then I took them out and put them back in the fridge. I couldn't do it. I had actually to make this cake. That's what I do. I walked off. But as I waited for my cake-making ingredients to move down the belt, I actually capitulated. Hold on! I yelled to the checkout girl. I need something else. Sprinted across the supermarket, grabbed all three cakes and some extra chocolate icing for good measure, threw them onto the conveyor belt along with the ingredients. I would make the final decision when I got home. By nine o'clock, the boys were tucked up and in bed, and my baking marathon could begin. My husband, who it has to be said had come to dread the night before the boys' birthdays, was fully encouraging and said things like, It's too late for a homemade cake. We don't have a theme. He's eight. He'll never know. He said all this while lazing on the sofa with a large glass of Shiraz. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all there. I can't cheat, I said. But as it turns out, uh, I could. 
To my shame, I piled all three chocolate cakes on top of one another to make a tiered chocolate mountain about a foot high, slathered them with extra shop-bought chocolate icing and plopped down on the sofa next to my husband, large glass of wine in hand, feeling relieved if a little guilty. And she's actually provided a photograph Goodness me. Of, oh, wow. of the cake, which I'm just showing as wow. evidence to yes. uh, Matt and Bobby. That is some chocolate That's feast. quite a lot of chocolate there. there yes. It's rather magnificent. OK. Birthday morning dawns, much excitement, present opening and off to school. Max returned with a number of his friends and after the usual frenzy of activity, the time came. I took a big breath, lit the candles, carried the chocolate tower cake out to make the big reveal. A look of total amazement came over the faces of the gathered party. What an incredible huge chocolate edifice. What an amazing mother. What more could any eight-year-old boy want? The boys duly dived in and all was good with the world. That night, as I tucked my tired but happy eight-year-old into bed, he leaned over, kissed me and said, Thank you, Mummy. That was the best cake ever. You're so clever. <laughs> <laughs> I he paused. really said that, did he? Now, now was not really... The, well, maybe it was. I should confess my... I don't know what to... Just to my adoring son, I could just tell him. Did I? No, of course I didn't. Instead, I took the glory. I kissed my son and said, That's my pleasure, darling. I'm so glad you loved it. Took ages. Deed done, you might think. Crisis averted, cake enjoyed and appreciated. All good. However, the reason for my confession is this. Keen to never again have to feel so bad, I have continued year after year to make sure I've made the cake in plenty of time, always with a ridiculously challenging theme and a long evening of icing, modelling and a grumpy husband with a bottle of Shiraz. And literally every single year, my son says something along the lines of, that cake was really great, Mum. But do you remember the chocolate tower one you made? <laughs> that was really, really amazing. He even mentions it when talking about his birthday at other times throughout the year. So every year I've been given the ultimate chance to confess, and every year I've smiled sweetly and just nodded. Yeah, I remember. Whew, that was great. So now I'd like to confess to Max. There he is on the coach. Uh, and I said, I'm sorry, and I'm glad you loved it, but I didn't make it. And yes, I did take all the glory. So, Father Simon, I request forgiveness not just from Max for not coming clean, but also from two groups of listeners. One, the baking congregation, who should know that making impressively decorated cakes really does take forever. And from the uh, overachieving parents all over the country who found themselves up all night baking birthday cakes, sewing a handmade little Red Riding Hood costume for World Book Day, or finishing the electrics on their son and daughter's 3D volcano <laughs> project that's due in tomorrow. <laughs> We've all done that. Yeah. Finally, of course... I should say, can you tell Max there is a cake waiting for him at home? And guess what it is? I bet. <gasps> I bet it's another one of those. Really? Yeah. I bet she's done another chocolate um, tower. It's Dry, a homemade dried one. fruit one, I think. No. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's favourite. Anyway. Uh, happy birthday. Anyway, happy birthday, Max. I think you're going to have a monster of a cake when you get home. But your, you know, the, this admiration for your mother, as far as the cakes are concerned, your favourite ever cake. Bit of a deception here, a few lies being told. What do you say, Sister Bobby? Well, parents of children will be breathing, uh, I think, a big sigh of relief at this story. Because the thing is, it's such a great, actually, revelation you're doing this now when he's 14. It's actually, Louise, the right time. Because obviously there's great value in making your own cakes in your family. That's the value. It's not about having... I mean, he has a cake. Enough said he has a cake. That's great. You usually make them. That's great. But this time, when you're working full-time as well and running a business... Give yourself a break. I understand about the deception, though, because obviously you didn't want your son to feel less important because you didn't have time to make it because you're too busy working and doing other things. That's the thing. That's the conflict with parents. And so sometimes therefore... they can't do it all. I think some oh, you're absolutely forgiven, but also teaching your son as well that he's can't always do it all is a good time and to do this at 14. All right, OK. Well, You've forgiven. Matthew. Well, I, I frankly think she's made a bit of a rod for her own back. I personally subscribe to the uh, school of parenting without the, f the faff. So what, why are you bothering with this designing and making a cake? Get, get a bit cake from the shop is absolutely fine. Even bothering with the icing. No, thank you. I'm yours. on the sofa with the Shiraz. However, I think uh, listeners with an ear for detail will have spotted the far more serious misdemeanour better buried within this confession. And that is the running off once you've put your stuff on the conveyor belt in the supermarket and go, oh, I'm going to get something else. No, once you've put the stuff on the conveyor belt, you've entered into a contract with the people behind you okay. in the queue oh, who right. have the number of okay, times we're into a soapbox territory. Dear Simon and the Collective, I feel it's time to get this terrible deed off my shoulders and confess to yourselves about a matter which occurred in the early 80s in Aberdeen. 
I worked at one of the local veterinary practices as a nurse, and one day old Mrs. Reed, one of our regular clients, came in with her ginger cat, Felix. Needless to say, he was not the nicest cat, and poor Mrs. Reed regularly came in with her arms, legs, and sometimes even her face scratched after Felix had decided to attack her for no apparent reason. After a lot of persuasion from ourselves, she finally agreed it was time to relieve Felix of some of his equipment to see if that would help his temperament. All oh, right, we're all there. Everyone's <laughs> caught up now. Yes, got it. Yeah, because that might that might have might, helped. Might help. We don't know. Who knows? Once Mrs. Reed said his goodbyes to Felix, and Felix was about to say goodbye, <laughs> <laughs> his equipment. We took him downstairs and gave him the anaesthetic, which was in itself not the easiest task, given his aforementioned temperament. Eventually we got him to sleep, and the vet quickly performed the operation before Felix was returned to his cage to recover. Now, it needs to be mentioned at this junction, it's common practice for us to leave the cage door ajar after an operation, the reason being it enabled us to intervene swiftly if the cat choked as they came round from the anaesthetic, which sometimes happened. However, Felix decided to come round a little bit quicker than most cats after his ob, and was up and out of his cage before we knew what was happening. Double bad luck for us was the fact that the safety door at the top of the stairs was wedged ajar, on account of it being a sunny day, and before we knew what was happening, Felix had managed to get himself past the first safety door and up the stairs. The last we saw of that darn cat... He was waddling along the back lane of the practice, and despite a number of us spending at least an hour hunting, Felix had disappeared and was nowhere to be found. It was at this point that panic started to set in, because despite his awful nature, we knew that Mrs. Reed loved Felix and would be lost without him. So what could we do? I think we all know what's coming. As we were trying to work out what to do next... One of the partners of the vet practice piped up that there were a couple of ginger cats at oh, the really? local dog and cat home that well, he was involved with, and that he'd go and fetch them up for us. What a stroke <laughs> of luck this was. <laughs> After a short time, the partner returned, and amazingly, one of the cats had an incredible resemblance to Felix. You'd almost swear it was the same cat if it wasn't for the fact that this cat was unbelievably affectionate and intact. Yes, Father Simon, Felix Mark II had clearly never had the snip which now posed us a moral dilemma for all of yes. five seconds. Mm. Ah. The vet swiftly did the deed, and our new Felix was now lighter <laughs> of, of his equipment, even though he didn't need to have it. No. This time we watched like hawks as he recovered, and once we were happy with him, we summoned Mrs. Reed to collect her cat, in inverted commas. She arrived about 30 minutes later, and as she took the new Felix out of his cage, I could feel the sweat gathering on my brow and my upper lip as we anxiously watched to see the reaction. Well, unbelievably, Felix the fraud was soon purring. He couldn't believe his luck. <laughs> I'm in here. And affectionately cuddled Mrs. Reed as if they'd known each other their whole lives. What a fraudster. And we could see our plan had actually unbelievably worked. Mrs. Reed was over the moon and thanked us profusely. I can't believe a simple operation could have had that effect so quickly, she said. And as she toddled out of the practice and into the awaiting taxi, she had a huge smile on her face. A few weeks later, Mrs. Reed actually phoned us to thank us for persuading her to go ahead with the operation and that she couldn't be happier with her Felix. She actually said the words, and I quote, He's just a totally different cat. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> to which we wanted to say, You've got that right, Mrs. Reed. So although we did... Actually, we actually did Mrs. Reed a huge favour. I still feel bad about losing the original Felix and then castrating another cat just to cover up our crime. Therefore, I fall at your mercy to speak on behalf of the nation. OK, so, so that's Therese uh, and her confession from early 1980s Aberdeen veterinary practices. Uh, and I can, I can see, because I suppose there's unethical behaviour in there. Bobby Pryor. Yeah, and I, I just cannot see on what grounds I can forgive. Because the other thing that really confuses me is you know your animals. 
these things that you have, these family members, even if they're in a bad mood and they're just suddenly in a good mood, I think she would know. I mean, I think it's the fact that she would want to believe. So she has some kind of, there's that kind of trick that you could go, well, this happened. So she has something to kind of qualify her doubt. She has something else has happened to him, so he is a different cat. But it is a different cat. Also, you Everyone's run the happy, risk. Though. Well, no, because Felix has gone missing and he's just had an operation. Yeah, Felix he, is horrible. Well, no, he wasn't horrible. It's just, you know, it's different he scratched, personality. He scratched Mrs. Reed. Well, maybe Mrs. Reed didn't hold him right. But the other thing is... So it was her fault. No, but what <laughs> is the kind of point Matt is, would say. Here's the risk. The risk to raise is, of course, if Felix actually made it home. And then she'd have had two cats. It, I mean, maybe, maybe Felix found another place. I hope nothing happened to Felix. But I think, actually, I can't forgive you because I don't think this would happen different times, eh, Matt? Well, yes. I think everyone's a winner here. I mean, uh, false Felix you know, get, gets a nice house. Uh, he's very happy. Mrs. Reed, she's over the moon. Can't believe her luck that uh, one simple operation and you've turned uh, uh, a cat that was obviously not really suited to her into into, into this fabulous cat. And, and, and we would surmise that probably Felix wandered out into the world and... Probably quite and, happy with his Yeah, very his happy with life. He, he decided do you know, why am I so angry at the world all the time? Maybe I need to change my perspective and i think he and, got the stray cat and, struck and thank thank thankfully i i now have uh, because of this incident involving uh, involving the vet so uh, i am going to forgive because you know it all brought us all together and uh, lessons for us <laughs> for so us all.